Charlie's job was to get pats on the black and tans, that strong arm force trying to keep order up and down the country. A tough bunch of boys, he concluded, reading between the lines again. Tough as they come and tough as they were told to be. Very handy too with guns, he found. Very handy indeed. This is going to you, Billy or Michael. Anybody. But Michael, I really want you. I already bet you, Billy. I already bet you in a minute. In one minute, I bet you in. I want you now, Michael. I want to put you to hospital. You hear me? You're good for nothing, robot. You're good for nothing! If I could grasp the fires of hell in my hands, I would cast them into the faces of my country's enemies. Strong words from a strong lad, John Mitchell, one of the boys up on the uh, National Monument here in the middle of Cork, surrounding, a, it has to be said, a, a pretty sexy Mother Erin in the middle. How are you, babe? So what's the story? This is essentially a, a monument to the Boom Boom Boys. And many countries might not want to have a monument to a so-called terrorists in the middle of their city. But that's not the case here, and we're going to find out why today. Ireland, you sexy country! And uh, just across from the National Monument to the Bowled Boys, we have uh, kind of one with a different vibe here. Lest we forget all those men who died in the Great War. When World War I was beginning, and the Brits needed all the manpower they could get, they said that if, uh, if the Irish sent enough people to help them, then we would get home rule, or a, a kind of type of diluted freedom. So 50,000 lads fucked off to the Great War. And died. From this city, 3,000 boys never made it back. And then, when all the bodies were counted, the Brits said, about that freedom, uh, nah. What? While the European royal families were sacrificing millions of innocents in the trenches in a civil war of the super rich, news of a failed uprising and brutal retaliation reached the Irish men serving in the British ranks and radicalised boys like the legendary Tom Barry. There was a communique up and it told of this rising in Dublin and it told of the executions of men whose names I never had heard. Uh, in short, the whole country apparently at that period was an accepted subject race of Britain. So you've got all these lads coming back from the Great War right, to find out they've been lied to, except boys. this time they've got the military know-how to fight back. Gorilla City, gorillas in the mist Got the rifle on the back, got the pistol in the fist Got the names of the dead men walking on the list They're gorillas, they're gorillas, they're gorillas that's enough of the context. In the years following the supposed victory of the British Empire against the forces of evil in Europe, a great camp fell across the continent. Because everyone was fucking dead. Britain had beaten the dastardly Germans who had dared to replicate the totally non-evil British Empire. And having finally secured the right of all small nations to be free, Britain sent thousands of war-hardened soldiers streaming into Ireland to remind the fucking paddies that not all small nations can be free. All the king's horses and all the king's men are being sent to their colonies to crush the descent from the trenches they wept in. They're sailing again across the waves to their graves in the glen. The people of Cork responded with their own very simple message. You're fucking with the wrong city, kid. Let's go for a walk. Collins Barracks, named after Cork's greatest son, the big fella, Michael Collins. It's home to Europe's largest military square and the shiniest army boots in the world. But uh, it wasn't always named after such an esteemed human. In the days before freedom, it was called Victoria Barracks, named after some thundering cunt from across the water from the house of Saxe Coburg Gotha, known today as Queen Victoria. She was known in Ireland as the Famine Queen for her callous treatment of the Irish during our greatest genocide on Gertha Moor, the Great Hunger, known today by revisionists as the Potato Famine. It was in this barracks that uh, the British Army and their assorted mercenaries kept watch for life over the natives of Cork, venturing out to harass, kidnap, murder, and otherwise keep the paddies in check and let them know who's in charge. But there's only a certain amount of centuries of bullshit that a people can take. And today we're going to find out what happens when a bunch of bowel boys stick their finger in the eye of Sauron.
So let's meet a couple of the characters at play here. First up, you got that abominable gowl bag, Winston fucking Churchill. To quote this total scrote, the Irish are an unusual people. They refuse to be English. Yeah, no shit. In January 1919, Winston Churchill became the Secretary of War in Britain, which made him responsible for law and order in Ireland, a prospect this cunt relished. He was also head of Irish affairs in the colonial office, because you gotta remember, Ireland was a fucking colony. So how do you quell a general insurgency in a colony? The problem in these post-World War days was that sending in an army to crush a national uprising would not be seen in a favourable light by the Americans, who had just fought a war with the British against the supposed forces of evil on the premise of them being the good guys. Are we the baddies? <laughs> so, what does Winston Churchill do? The genius. He doesn't send in an army, he creates the fucking Black and Tans. The Black and Tans, a big rabbit bag, bag of bastards. bastards. Shoot the natives in the face and ask, ask questions after. after. Winston back in England, the puppeteer and master. The Tans drew their guns, but the rad drew faster. Doing churches dirty work up and down the island. The age old art of colonial violence. But the boys are in position, hiding in the silence. Hold fire till you see the whites in the rice, kid. In his attempt to crush the Irish government and the People's Army, Overseer Lloyd George outlawed the Doyle and recruited thousands of brutalised veterans he had discarded after the Great War. Their job was to hunt down enemies of the Crown and terrorise the population through collective punishments of beatings, burnings and murder. But as always, the King's mercenaries for hire learned what happens when you try to beat a man on another man's land. On the evening of December 11th, 1920, two truckloads of tans left the barracks. It was just supposed to be an ordinary chill night of murder, kidnap and torture. And as these tans drove down this road here, Lord of all they surveyed, they hadn't a care in the world. The day before martial law had been declared in the city, these were great days to be a tan. Something tells me everything is going to be all right. But there was a surprise in store. Hey. Just down the street from Victoria Barracks, six members of the Cork Number no. 1 Brigade, the IRA Volunteers, were waiting in lay. Here come the boom boom boys The old school rebels with the new school toys It's the Cork number one brigade Six boys, let's learn their names The first up is the captain of the crew Sean O'Donoghue What the fuck you gonna do? When this fella's coming through and running up in front of you The rifle of a prisoner Aimed at the jailer Invaders beware of the big Michael Baylor Chucking a grenade into the trailer Really? Brains and brawn, guns drawn Sean Healy Hear ye, hear ye, now you got to be weary Of rock solid volunteer Augustine O'Leary The first battalion here to Kick in the door With James O'Mahony Big Jim to the fore Lead is heavy The enemy could never be ready For the 11th of December And my boy Michael Kenny Now you know the names of all the boys They use rifles Mills bombs And five of them right where we are here Crouched down behind the wall As two truckloads of tans came down the street Five volunteers waited here behind the wall And just across the street was their scout Michael Kenny when he saw the tans approaching, he gave two whistles and the boys knew it was time to get saucy. Saucy, 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 saucy. One of the volunteers stepped directly out into the street in face of the oncoming trucks of tans. He shouted stop, which they did. And then he hurled his grenade into the fucking middle of them and the firefight began. Their choice of weapons, a couple of rifles and a few mill bombs. Uh, I couldn't get any rifles or bombs, so we're going to have to make do with um, yeah, a couple of potatoes and a rolled up cork independent and a bottle of Tenora for the thirst, but you get the idea. Are you finished? Doing the black and tan ambush. No, the, 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 uh, the Tenora, my son, he loves it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because it's the potatoes, you have to have Tenora. You have to have the Tenora. 
Tanora was the codename of the greatest IRA double agent of the War of Independence. He was so convincing that people couldn't tell if he was a tan or in the rat. He was a gunman in Michael Collins' famous squad who was involved in several actions in West Cork. As a spy with the ability to speak like a pompous cunt, he was able to penetrate deep into the British establishment and once even knocked out Churchill in a bar fight. He later ran for the Irish presidency but died of diabetes and is now honoured with a tangerine flavoured sugar drink. And to be honest lads, he tastes pretty damn good. So right here in the street is where the firefight took place. A lot of casualties for the Brits, but the Bowel Boys from Cork, after the attack, melted back across into Callaghan's fields, and Michael Kenny bowled down the road that way. After the quick ambush, there was 12 injured Brits and one dead man by the name of Chapman, and the Ra were long gone. Some of the tans had only been in Ireland two weeks. Welcome to fucking Cork, kid. The IRA suffered absolutely no casualties, and the tans went back up to Victoria Barracks to nurse their wounds. But they'd be back down this road soon enough again. They had dogs to help them find the rebels. One wonders whether they needed Irish dogs to track down Irishmen. So as the volunteers disappeared into the surrounding countryside, the Brits gathered together a couple of thousand boys and they started streaming down this hill. When the black and tans and their assorted barrels of bastards parked up here at Dillon's Cross, they started setting fire to... Oh, look at this boy. What's the crack, boy? <laughs> when the tans reached Dillon's Cross, they started burning, looting and shooting. You know, the, the usual story. They burned down the old Fenian Brian Dillon's house, which is right behind me here. As they were pulling people out of their houses, they stripped a couple of them naked, forced them into the middle of the road here, and made them sing God Save the King. A timeless British tradition of homoerotic violence against the natives, and still practiced today by lads on tour all across Europe. When they finished burning down Dylan's cross, they weren't quite satisfied, you know? This, this is just a little cross. You're not gonna get the message out to the people like this. So they continued coming down this street looting and shooting and setting fire to whatever the fuck they wanted. So as these foul gulls continued marching on towards the city centre, the usual calming effect that walking has on a human would have been verified null and void as they passed the smouldering remains of other barracks that had been burnt out by those pernicious locals here at St. Luke's a couple months earlier. Three of their barracks had been burnt out in the weeks previous to this. One at St. Luke's, one down the hill and one on the lower road. You'd think that they would have gotten the message by now that they weren't welcome here. But the British establishment were never great for picking up on social cues. Like, you're not welcome here. And can you please stop with the rape and pillage, please? These were all very, very difficult concepts for the Ubermensch. Following in these filthy footsteps of the Black and Tans brings us down Summer Hill and to our next location called Empress Place. This was the uh, original barracks that the Black and Tans were in when they first came to Ireland in March 1920. God knows how many horrors and privations were meted out to those unfortunate enough to find themselves guests of his majesty. You would have been lucky enough to leave with your fingernails, let's put it that way. And uh, it's one star rating on TripAdvisor is well deserved, as these reviews will show. Having stopped for a nice cup of tea and a chat, these heroes of the British Empire continued on their evening stroll down Summer Hill and into the flat of the city centre. Gorilla City, gorillas in the mist Got the rifle on the back, got the pistol in the fist Got the names of the dead men walking on the list They're gorillas, they're gorillas, they're gorillas